here. Uh, I certainly know the people that take care of us in the back there. Um, so yeah, welcome again to the School of Data Journalism, uh, organized by European Journalism Center, represented here by my colleague Mirko and myself from Open Knowledge. Uh, this is something we've been doing for the past three or four years um, at the International um, Journalism Festival here in Perugia. We're, we're organizing this track. We're trying to um, to give journalists the skills they need to use data and produce data-driven stories. Um, so we have always a mixture between of, of panels and high-level discussions and more practical workshops. So you're here at the first more practical workshop, so I hope you will kind of pull out your computers and, and work with us uh, as much as possible. Um, so yeah, now we have, we have a workshop about, um, am I right to say data visualization? as how to use charts. Um, and like the, the top simple charts you can use to create stories with, uh, with data. Uh, so again, this is, this is the first in a series. We have more. We have another one this afternoon on maps. We have more workshops tomorrow after tomorrow. And we are having as well a, a really hands-on data expedition where you'll get to play with some data and use the skills uh, you've, you've learned uh, in the week. Um, there's also by popular demand certificates, so come, come talk to us uh, if towards the end of the whole kind of series of workshops you would like to have a certificate from us. Um, and yeah, that's it. I'll pass on the mics to Mirko and, and Greg, Gregor, who's, who are going to talk to you about uh, charts and database and all sorts of stuff like that. You guys want to start? Okay. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, expecting a diverse uh, audience with some people knowing perfectly how to create a chart, but often discussing with journalists and other being more journalists, not having to do with charts all the time. We have um, a mix of both so that everybody takes out something from here. I'm going to start with a brief introduction from the journalist perspective. Like, um, I wrote the text, I have my topic, or I'm about to write my, my text and, and still looking into data. How can I meaningfully interact with the graphics department? What can I do myself? What is the thinking behind effective, correct charts? And then we switch over to Gregor, uh, who's going to talk about the process of enhancing simple charts they are using at the New York Times, which should be really interesting. And then in the third segment, we're going to switch again, and we want to do a little exercise with you. We call it a three by three. It's um, a professional way of brainstorming about charts we might be doing without starting the tools too early, but first thinking about what you can do. Uh, you will see, I think it's a fun experience. It's interesting to discuss, to find out how could we visualize that, what would be a good way, and still making, uh, keeping it manageable. So without further ado, I start right away. Um, this is the overview, as I just said, basics, a little bit of advance from Gregor, the three by three, and there will be room for questions and resources and that kind of stuff. We are arguing in these one and a half hours that with basic charts, uh, you can achieve 90% of what data-driven journalism can do. Of course, you can delve into charts for two weeks, do much more, but is that always a good equation? That's to ask, because often we are time-driven. We are needing to visualize today and not in two weeks. So uh, this will be known to many, but it's kind of a mantra. Um, one idea, and I'm sorry that I'm picking on uh, one publication here, it's uh, a common habit across all kinds of media. Uh, when it's too abstract, we use something like a stock photo, right? And it's not just one, everyone is doing that. This is a story about young people in Germany being indebted, and the, whole, the only visualization is this stock photo. And what we are um, trying to advertise, what we are trying to push forward is, think about doing a good chart that makes the, the, the story of how people getting indebted on mobile charges uh, in your country and enhance the story. So there's another reason why we need to visualize, and it's a relatively new finding. This is um, Anscom's Quartet. Uh, it was a scientific article uh, published by a um, statistician who came from the UK and then worked at uh, Princeton in the US. Um, and he argued in this uh, Anscom's Quartet why we need to visualize even scientific findings. If you would do some calculations on this data, it's one, two, three, four data sets, uh, you would find the same median and some other things that would tell you that the data is very close together. 
And only when we visualize, we see the pattern behind the data. That's a point here. If you uh, already know Anscom's quartet, you might pick this up to show it around in your newsroom just to argue for why we need the visualization. As you can see now, which was not visible from the data set, we have on the, on the lower right, we have an interesting outlier. Uh, is that a mistake or is that the story? Uh, and that is the thinking behind these basic visualizations that help you getting the story. Then another reason why we um, uh, should be looking into even simple visualizations is that the eye can simply conceive the information contained much quicker, uh, even under the circumstances of looking at a beamer here. On the left we have a text, on the right we have a, uh, the, the same information as a, mi a micro chart. Um, you can just you know, draw the eye of the reader to the story you want to tell. It's quite pragmatic. It's nothing behind creating these charts. Um, it's just that you think uh, um, of it in the process of producing your story. Then something that might be uh, perfectly clear to all graphic artists, graphic uh, um, experts, but not to anyone else, um, if you take out elements of a chart, it gets better. This is from an animated GIF that is uh, worth watching. It's by Dark Horse Analytics, and it's called Data Looks Better Naked. I've shortened it a bit here. This is how you get sometimes charts from popular tools like Excel or PowerPoint. Um, and it's better to uh, throw away almost all the elements that you have in order to get the story out much clearer. Uh, so I go back. All these elements are just dressing up the key story. So uh, what the experts tell you is, uh, reduce the number of elements and you uh, come up with a better chart. Then um, we're moving on fast. Um, how, how could I start at all? The main point about, from a journalist's perspective, starting a chart is that you show a comparison. If this, the red dot or the green dot would, here, would be standing here alone, you would not be able to tell whether red is big or small or whether green is big or small. And even under these circumstances, if these are percentages, if these are representatives of, of if without the context, without a comparison, most data is not meaningful. So well, that is the first task that we are after, um, being able to compare. It's a quote by Edward Tufter, who wrote the most important books on data visualization, to be truthful and revealing, data graphics must bear on the question at the heart of quantitative thinking, compared to what? Uh, to give a clearer example, if you get new unemployment data, um, compared to what? Is that high? Is that low? Is that high related to other countries, other regions in Italy? This comparison is making the data more meaningful. And then this is quoting from a chart uh, published by 37 Signals. Three charts are all I need. Um, he's arguing here a little bit against um, using fancy charts just because they are fancy. Um, which is easily done. He says, when you want to show something has changed over time, so you have any dates in there, use a line chart. When you want to show how something is distributed, use a histogram or a bar chart, or a column chart in this uh, specific case. A histogram would be a change where the, the number of, um, uh, of bars is much closer together, um, so showing a distribution of data, of, of a lot of data. And then finally, the third one, um, tables. Uh, it's kind of a bit contradicting to what I just said about Anscom's Quartet, but when you want to uh, be able to communicate specific data points that your readers can look up, you can use a table. And you will find um, the Guardian data block in its golden years, like a few years ago, um, used tables quite a bit at the end of the article. They would usually only be read by 1% to 2% of the readers, but these readers would potentially enhance the story by pointing out errors, pointing out outliers, pointing out deeper stories. Uh, they had a really nice habit of publishing the data they used in the article as open data so that you could look it up yourself and make use of it. Um, for anyone who is interested in, in getting into this, here are two books that we would recommend. The first one is the Wall Street Journal Guide to Information Graphics by Donna M. Wong. Um, what I like about it, it's highly readable. Uh, readability meaning it's not sitting on your shelf. You, you pick it up, you can read it, it shows you the bad practice and how to do it better. And in like one to three days, you are much better in seeing mistakes in most common charts. And that is a good skill to have. 
A bit more complex on the right side is a book by uh, Edward Tufter. It goes much deeper into visualization history. It's not so pragmatic on day-to-day -day use, but it tells you the background of why certain things have been developed and so on. Then um, that came out of a discussion between Gregor and me. Uh, Gregor is currently reading a book from the 60s that got republished later. It's kind of the foundational book for data-driven journalism or computer-assisted reporting by Philip Meyer, The New Precision Journalism. And this is just a pointer. The book is available for free uh, in Word chapters. And on this page, uh, you can download the book and uh, you can Google it, Philip Meyer Download, um, The New Precision Journalism. And it's worth reading because it shows you principles of statistics applied to journalism. And it shows uh, to some other extent how far a journalist can get in understanding all these techniques to tell better stories. Then um, another recommendation very briefly, in order to create strong charts, you must yourself see a lot of charts. There's no way around it. Uh, maybe you're aware of the 10,000 hour rule to become a real expert. I recently found statistical data on chess players, uh, how long they took to become world-class chess players. And they had another finding uh, on top of the 10,000 hours. They found that the uh, chess players that would simulate the games of other chess makers more would enhance faster. Mm -hmm. So um, doing that for a time, emulating, replicating the work of others and trying to understand why they came to certain decisions can form out quite an uh, expert status over time. This is just one hint. I like this page. It's Dada with. They're not collecting so high level charts. They're just collecting any example, but they have like 2,000 of them by them on their homepage. So you can just scroll down and get on ideas, see charts, how they did and how, what, what, uh, how they were published from a variety of sources. Uh, second example that I like a lot, it's a collection of charts only from the New York Times and The Guardian, who are currently arguably uh, leading the field. Uh, it was done by Marie Ross from the Netherlands, and she has now 439 charts. It's very nice because you can filter through by topic and find all the charts and then you get linked to the Guardian or New York Times pages. So it's a good resource to see high level charts um, that are, uh, have been published. So we already looked at great graphics that might take a day, might take a week, might take even a month to make. Um, but all of these great works start their life as small charts in the very beginning. Um, this is one example that was recently published by John Byrne Murdoch in the um, uh, Financial Times. I think I have it online and I have a Wi-Fi connection. Wait, I restarted. It's a bit playful. It shows the height of the highest buildings and the speed of the elevators. Um, but it's hard to not look at it. Um, and what I like about it, it's, it's essentially two bar charts mixed together, right? The, high, the height of the building and then the speed of the elevators. And it goes on and on. It's like a ma micro game. And it's uh, uh, embedded in a highly um, economical article because along with the race to um, the profile of having the highest building, they have to solve a lot of technical problems like the speed of the elevators. So the, the elevators in these things are highly technical. And here you can see how they relate to each other. And that is the quality of it, the, the compared to what, right? It tells you which elevator is the fastest. And uh, to some extent, I think John Byrne Murdoch just was able to do it in D3, and that's why this chart came to life. But it's still, um, it's, uh, uh, here's a, a, an even higher level example. It's a New York Times visualization from the 2012 Olympics. It's actually a video, and it's talking about uh, um, um, the winner of the 2012 Olympics, Usain Bolt, and how far other runners were behind. Um, to all the Olympic Games since the beginning. The average yes, uh, they were calculating how far the other were behind, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's uh, impressive. It's a 3D camera movement, and as I said, it's a video with a comment on. But at the, at the back of it, here you can see how they're calculating. And that's my point here. Even that has a journalistic research element in it as somebody has looked up the Olympic data from uh, the winners of gold, uh, silver, and bronze medals, and again came up with a bar chart. This is turned around that the uh, Usain Bolt on the far right would be the winner, and this would be the first Olympic Games. And here you see the chart. 
Um, another chart that is really, really impressive, one of my favorites, um, because it breaks rules and still comes with a very clear message. It's from 2007, uh, again from the New York Times by Sean Carter and Amanda Cox and Kevin Creeley. Um, it's a jobless rate for people like you. Why is it breaking a rule? Because it has 240 lines in it. And normally you cannot do that. In print, you cannot mix 240 uh, lines into one. But it works with filters, and the filters help to show that the average unemployment is not applicable to all age groups. And whenever I show it to a group of people, everyone is clicking into his filters, so people are interacting with it very intuitively. But um, there's an interview with Amanda Cox, how she gets to these insights, and what she says, and that's the essential part here, she's always doing a lot of pre-charting and pre-visualization before she reaches these very creative outcomes. And at times has 200, uh, 200 pages in a PDF, which she flips through just to find out what the story might be here. So uh, a brief thing on tools. Um, and I use this camera, it's like an 8,000 euro camera, the EOS One. Um, it's kind of obvious if you want to be a photo photographer and buying this camera, this might not be the solution. Over time, yes, when you're an expert photographer and you're at the right place. But at the very beginning, it's much more important that you learn to take pictures, that you learn to be at the right situation, that you get in yourself into the right position to take a photo. So the tools won't cut it. Because always when I'm training younger journalists, they say, give me a tool and I'm done. And actually, it's a little bit the other way around. First, you form an idea, and then you use the tool that helps you to do the job done. And Gregor will show how tools can be combined in a minute. So this is just an overview for people wanting to enter the field. Um, this is the Juice Labs chart chooser. And it's quite handy because um, these are templates for both PowerPoint and Excel. And they have figured out all the nitty gritty stuff on doing correct charts in Excel, like uh, the legends and all that stuff. You can copy the chart that you see here, put in your own data, and you're done. So it's two hours less on working, trying to find out how to visualize it with Excel. So it's a good resource. Uh, it works for PowerPoint and for Excel. And it's free. Uh, second thing, um, that is paying in on a, on a larger trend. Uh, creating charts in the browser, which is needed in the newsroom because there's just no time. Um, there is no way um, asking the graphics department first and then wait a day. You know, if you're in online journalism, you get some data, and at best you have it published in a correct way 20 minutes later, uh, or 10 minutes later, or five minutes later. The, 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 the faster, the better. And this is a tool, it's a Quartz um, chart builder. It's a browser-based tool. It's not storing the data. You just import the data, create a chart, and off you go. And it creates certain charts. That is a tool that we actually have built together, Data Wrapper. It's the same thing. It's a tool to create simple, basic charts very quickly in the browser. It was free for three years. Uh, since uh, December, we are charging a certain amount, which is helpful to keep the project running. And it's, it, it has healthy usage around the world in newsrooms. Um, could be more developed, but we are, we're looking into it. It's just a hint at some tool. But one step back. If you haven't seen that, have a look at that. It's a really nice project that is currently going on. It's called Dear Data, and it's um, an exchange of normal postcards that are sent by snail mail between two friends in London and New York, and they do it every week. Uh, on the front side, they do the visualization as a handwritten thing. On the back side, they write the concept and how to read the chart. It's very playful, very creative, uh, got a lot of press around the world, dear data. That's about the thing that we want to do with you. Like, move you away a little bit from, from, from using a tool too fast and let your imagination flow. Yeah? What would be the story you would like to tell? How could it look like? Uh, even in simple charts, this emulating before you start firing up the computer can be very helpful to move you along. Dear data is the address. So, um, kind of coming to the, the final bit of my part, this is like the very, very basic advice to uh, starters. Uh, if you ever touched charts and so, you might know that, but um, I shortened it at the same time. And most of it is from Donna M. Wong, which I have here. I can show it around if you're interested later. Um, 
What is good about the book is that it tells you how to enhance the charts. For example, here, the bars have the double width of the white space, which means the bars are clearly visible. If they are too small, it's harder to read. Um, when there is an estimate, uh, it should have a different color to show that this is an estimate. Yeah, it's kind of just a glimpse into what you can do about a chart. Then on the lower right, uh, how do I show negative values? Huh? If something has grown, uh, has been negative, uh, growth of a company, and is now positive. Huh? Um, then with bar charts, I mean, it, once you read the book, you would say, oh, that's obvious. For uh, beginners, it's uh, still something, and uh, for fo uh, Fox uh, in the US, it's still something they don't do. They like to cut bar charts. Um, the difference between these two charts on the left and the right is that the one on the left uh, is not starting at zero. So it's, it's showing a distorted image of the, uh, the bars. Uh, you cannot do that with bars. With lines, uh, there are discussions about how to focus on the area of line that is most important. But um, the correct one is on the right side, um, where the uh, y-axis is running for starting at zero and going to 100. So this is um, a simple, quick visualization that one can do with a tool like Data Wrapper. It's an, a micro interactive comparison about the most favorite uh, professions. And here's just a hint. If you have a lot of text, um, use um, a bar chart in the original sense where the bars are going um, horizontal. Because in this chart, you can get the text on the left side. Uh, Gregor, you said that there's even some argument that humans can read this kind of charts much better than the ones on height. Though this is all uh, debatable as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can see by comparison which uh, professions are more um, favored or not. And what we are arguing for, such an article can give a spine, a visual spine to any text that you write along with it. And if you use several of those, you can actually argue from data, which is stronger than the stock photo that we just got rid of, and then have a, a back and forth with the data. Um, again, just an example how much data and how much information can fit in such a chart. Um, there's a median in the middle, but you can see New Zealand is leading. Italy is uh, on the uh, last place for uh, investments, see? Uh, but you can read it very quickly, right? So, uh, variations of that, um, uh, this is um, uh, stack bars. Um, and uh, here the information is what is the revenue Apple is making from iPads, from iPhones, from, from the iPod. And as you can see, uh, the iPhone has risen in uh, uh, the amount it's making for Apple quite quickly. And that is just a variation. But it's still a quite simple chart. It's still a quite simple table behind it. And you can tell quite a, a large story. So again, we are still moving with bar charts. Um, this is a big story being told just with charts. Uh, it's about um, the deficit of the US. Um, on the uh, left side, the black bars are what Clinton achieved in the last two years of his uh, administration. He actually pulled it off to get uh, the American state finances to positive results. And the gray bars and on the upper side are the projections of the fiscal um, body saying, yeah, it will go on like that. Then they had a policy change. They had wars, they had investments, they had tax cuts on the bush, uh, bush and uh, this is the actual deficit on, the, on the, um, the red one. And that's what Obama has inherited lately. And um, it kind of, what you can do wrong about it is if you don't have this time frame over 10, 12 years, you can sh uh, argue that Obama has racked up all the deficit without telling the story. And you see charts like that that are shortening the story um, um, in a way. There's one mistake in this chart, um, uh, which you cannot do like that. Anybody has a hint on that? What, what is not correct in this chart? I, sh I show in a second. Um, what they do here, they have it added with a timeline. Right, Clinton and Bush and Obama. And they have it through the zero point of the bar charts. So they are kind of lengthening the maximum distance between the bar charts. So it would be better, that's my, our argument, to put the um, timeline on top of it. Huh? See the difference? So 
Quickly, same saying, it's not everything you need to know about Barcha, there's a bit more, of course, but it's just trying to instill the idea that it's possible to tell quite interesting stories with these basic forms. This is a line chart, and for line charts, it's again important that they have a good ratio and they ha cover a certain time frame. This is, it's in German, uh, managers of state-owned companies by party orientation. It's from Austria, like uh, they had changes um, like which managers would lead the company uh, based on um, the party there. This is just a hint at how creative you can become with line charts. Mm, this is uh, the duration of uh, a very, uh, different recessions. Um, one recession from 1929 to 1934 that was in the UK, 1973 to 1978. So you have a problem here. If you would put them on a time frame, it would be a time frame like that, right? And what they did, they put all the charts to zero on the same value and then simply measured how long it took in a recession to come back to positive growth, making the recessions comparable. I find it a very intuitive, uh, easy use um, to compare something that is otherwise very difficult to compare because you were able to tell that the most recent, um, uh, the most recent recession, the one from 2008 to 2012, was still going on in 2015. You see the dotted line on the lower? It hasn't moved up to the positive area as well. So I go through that um, quickly. Um, that is the point about line charts. Um, if you do make them, if you are not choosing the right ratio for, for the area to look at, um, you're running into problems. This is the same data. On the left, it's uh, too shallow, and on the right, the whole data got pressed for some purpose, and all of a sudden, it looks like a, 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 um, an incredible rage. It's the same data. So you see what is a, a peril in using line charts. If you, don't, um, if you compress them too much, you end up with this uh, false impression of a rise on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Then, um, uh, again, uh, a small hint, uh, always when you have more than three uh, lines, uh, on the left side we have four, uh, the chart is bordering on becoming unreadable. It's very difficult to uh, decide which line you should follow. There are two ways to solve that. One is um, shading out all the lines you don't want to show, just show one, or put them side by side as a small multiple. So that's what I did on the lower end. These are the same charts put side by side. And as you can see, your eyes are perfectly capable of seeing the charts compared. Um, it's much easier to see that. And this is the application of this principle. It's called small multiples, um, that you put data from a variety of, of sources side by side. This is um, a chart uh, um, data on how Americans spend their day. And what you can take away from it on the lower uh, right, the second one from, from the right, uh, even if you have no data like sport and recreation, it tells a story. Oh, um, this is this uh, chart uh, published by the New York Times with the filters. So if you click on the filters, you can go through all these uh, levels of unemployment for certain groups in the population. Um, and the filters allow that. So finally, uh, tables. Tables can always be very, very useful and contain a lot of information if you don't have the time to do a chart, if you want to uh, actually publish the data point. What we find a lot of people are trying to do, they have a table like that and they try to put it all into one chart. And very often it's much easier to put that into several charts in instead of compressing everything into the same message. Um, one thing that uh, tables should be doing is that they are responsive on the web so that you don't lose the upper legend when you scroll down or you look in a smaller uh, visual display. So that would be uh, switching over, Gregor, to the 3x3, three three, so we switch uh, laptops, right? So we do this, uh, your exercise, in a, in a bit. Uh, first I will try to set this up. Um, 
Lena says I, sh I should introduce yourself uh, you, uh, briefly. Oh, I can introduce myself. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, for those who don't know me, um, I'm Gregor, Gregor Eich. I work at the New York Times in the graphics department um, uh, since about uh, one year and four months. And um, yeah, and we do the graphics for the New York Times. That's the short version. Um, <laughs> we try to, uh, let me try to click this. There's some Uh, it might work. Oh, oh, I got the wrong. So I got it on this screen. Um, oh, I need to get it. Was another right resolution, right? That's still working. So this is the screen. I just changed this one. It should be 720. Yeah. And now, yeah. okay. <coughs> yeah, this looks good. I think I'm good. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I I want to uh, tell a little bit about how. Like I would, I want to try to to change your view on charts and how we read charts and how we should make charts a little bit. So to do that, I'm just going through an example. Um, I just made up the data, so it's not a real thing. But um, at first, it starts like the cam the canvas is empty. I know, I know it's empty. That's that's uh, on purpose. So we start with emptiness, and then we just have like a little line going through nowhere land. And we don't really know anything about this line. We have no idea of, uh, of space or location, where, where this could happen, what this could be. This could be just like the silhouette of a mountain, for instance. Um, so as soon as we add the first axis, uh, so we, we know this looks like a year. So this is supposedly a, a time, time scale. So there's something happening over time. But still, we don't know like, what, is, what is the, the, the uh, vertical axis, what, is it, what does it mean? Like there's a time, but there's no location, there's no subject we, we can uh, attach to it. So it's pretty, we're pretty much lost. Um, we can add a second dimension to it, the, the vertical one, and then we, we see some numbers, two, four, six, eight, and we have a euro sign, which means it's probably about uh, some money, maybe it's a price, maybe it's, but we don't really know. Um, it's like having, having a, a map, in front of you, like a map of a city with, with just a line on, and, and you just have like the latitudes and longitudes on the side. So you're looking at it, you have some information, and in theory, you could like, if you would know all the, all the things that, ha that are located, like if you know all the streets and know all the hotel locations of the hotels, then a, a map like this would help you to get around, but the thing is that you don't have all the information in your head all the time, so you need some kind of context on a map. That's why a good map, of, like a good street map, has a lot of little like information. You have the street names, you have hotels, you see, oh, there's, a, there's this mountain, or there's a lake, or there's a, um, all kinds of things that, that you know the location of in the real world, and, and you know it on a map. But in this chart, we, we, we don't have any of this. So I can, I can add some titles, so this would tell you that this might be like the stock price of a company, but still, you, 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 you don't know a lot of, maybe you don't know a lot about the company. Maybe you don't know a lot about what happened over time of, on this company. So this is where most charts stop. So this is what most charting tools provide. If you do like a chart in Excel, this would be the, the, the end. Or even in Data Wrapper or in Google Charts, this is kind of where most, most of, the, uh, of the charts stop. And it's, uh, obviously you can, you can always write some, like, um, some introduction sentence and tell something more about it. But what's actually nicer is to think of this as a map. And you can add some more uh, context to this map to help people uh, to navigate this, this two-dimensional space. So for instance, I could add like a, 
there was like a, a good news report on, the, on this company. Maybe there was some, some kind of event that the readers might remember. And then you could just say, this happened here. And though, so you get some kind of context about why this might have been like uh, a successful uh, time for the company. And then there was like a shocking news. Something happened in, uh, in 2005. And uh, so, aha, I, now I remember this. And now I get some kind of idea where this line goes in this virtual space of time and, uh, and stock price. And you can finish the story with just like a, uh, it's like saying what, what you see, that the price went down almost in a free fall. And this is kind of um, a nice way to, to annotate a chart, and it's also a nice way to read the chart. Because we, we follow, there's like a natural progression from left to right for the time, and we also read from left to right in our culture. So uh, you kind of start reading the story in the chart rather than having it like separate in some separate text. Um, here's like an example that I just like uh, looked up. This is a chart that we made like, this is 2006 so, but we do those charts all the time. And the thing is not just to, 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 to plot the, the, the prices of home values, so like it's probably like an average price of home values, um, but to over a long time, it starts in 1890 if you can read it and it goes to 20, uh, I would say 28 maybe, because uh, you, you all know what happened next, it, like when went down sharply. So, um, but with what this chart was adding is was adding some context for what happened. So this is World War One, this first line. Then you have the Great Depression, World War Two. You have some booms in the uh, <coughs> in the 70s and 80s, and then the the last housing boom. Then we all know how it ended. Um, so this is kind of a uh, nice way to, uh, to guide a reader. And i just give you a second example. This is now a real data set. I just looked it up yesterday. It's just such a nice weather outside. Um, so I just looked up the uh, temperature in, in Rome. I didn't find a data set for Perugia. So this is a, a five-day moving average of the, tempera, the temperature in Rome. And it starts in April 2014, like one year ago. And it goes to... Um, like last week or something, um, and now we, we we again we have the time axis. We have some we have we have some numbers on the on the vertical axis. We have the the degrees Celsius, so we know like the the two D world, but we don't really know how this relates to anything that that that, that we attach to because we never feel the average temperature. Um, so one way to uh, make this more tangible is. Um, to add a range of temperature that we actually perceive. So this is, uh, for each week, the minimum and maximum temperature. So it goes down to almost uh, like two degrees and uh, went almost down to two degrees in, in April. Um, then you have the winter, December, January, February, where it goes down to the minus degrees. And this kind of gives this little line a, a, a place. So um, one thing that the, the Times is doing every year um, oh yeah, you can also like add lo legal annotation. Like this is the coldest week, this is the warmest week, um, or the week with the warmest day. Um, this is a chart that the Times is running um, uh, repeatedly. It, sh it shows the like just the weather in New York for one year, um, and what what you what you see in here is in the purple bars are the actually the, the actual temperatures for each uh, for each week. So you have a high of the week, you have the, the low of the week. Um, and then, but the context here, you have two layers of context. The, the dark gray band is the normal range, which is con like b based on the climate of this uh, of the city, like it's a 30 years average, I assume. Um, this is the temperature range which is assumed to be normal for this time. So you kind of see the, di the diversion from this normal. Like it's always like this, was this winter especially cold or was the summer too hot or was it not hot enough? Um, the other thing that, that was added here, the light gray, is the, um, is the absolute record temperatures over time. So you want to know if this was like a, uh, the hottest the hottest week in, uh, in, in history. So in some, in, in some points in this, in 2006, uh, there, the temperature reached something like new records, um, essentially moving the gray bars for the next years. Um, and it's a nice example of, um, 
<coughs> of uh, giving this raw data some context to, uh, to give you a, a, a kind of a map to read it. Um, the problem with this is, uh, with this nice example, drink a little bit of water, um, yeah. that even though you might, you might want to do it, and a good, and a good way to practice the, this kind of annotations actually is to, if you make a chart in Excel or with your, to, your tool of choice, you just print it out on a piece of paper and take a pen. And then you go to someone who doesn't know this data, doesn't know this chart, and you just explain it to, to him or her. And you take your pen and you say, like, look, look what happened. And you would, you would draw some arrows, you would, you would point to, to interesting facts. But now, how, how would you do this in a, in a chart that you would publish in your, uh, with, with an article? Or, um, so most, most tools don't allow this, this level of freedom. Uh, they, they all use kind of some kinds of templates, so there's this line chart template, and there's limited stuff that you can do, but you, you usually can't just draw like an arrow somewhere or like make, make a gray background. Um, but there are, there are tools that can do it. So um, Illustrator is one of the tools. This is one of the greatest uh, graphic tools in, in, in the world, and we, we use it all the time. And it's, it is probably used if you're working in a newspaper and you go to like the print graphic, uh, they, they will use it. And there will be people who are perfectly able to, to make those kinds of charts. Um, and they will probably run it for, for, the, for the print uh, edition. But the problem is how can you publish these graphics, these nice graphics, uh, like handcrafted graphics online? And um, one, one obvious idea is to just uh, make the graphic in Illustrator and then export it as an image. Um, or if you don't like the, the graphic tools in Illustrator, you can just make the chart in any charting tool that you want, like Data Wrapper or even Excel. And you can, like there's a trick in Excel, you can, you can make a bar chart or whatever chart, and you can just uh, control C it, so you, co you copy it and then you paste it into Illustrator and you, and you have this kind of vectors and you can work with it. That's much easier than using um, the Illustrator charting tools, which hadn't been like uh, improved over the last decade. Um, and then, but still, you, you export it as image. But the image export is kind of a, a problem because images are not responsive. So while this image would would work perfectly in your article online, uh, what what do we do on the phone? And there you have this, uh, you have a nice text that is readable, but then you have this like chart that has been reduced in size, so it's hard to read the numbers. You might have a high-res phone and you could take out your, your, your uh, reading glasses and then you might be able to decipher it. Uh, or the other way, it, you could work it, you make the chart for, for the phone and then you, don't, you have like an ugly big version and you see those, those two examples uh, online all the time. Um, so this is the problem that, um, that, we, that we had a while ago. And, um, also, we have um, we 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 are, the, we are facing the problem of we having young graphics editors who are able to make um, online charts, and when we have by very good um, experienced um, graphic editors who are perfectly trained to do print charts, and how do you bring those? in? you want to we talked about this this morning, like having those two teams in one team and just building building from there instead of having the knowledge in two different centers. So. One way to, um, to bring these together is to make a tool that allows to come from Illustrator to the web. And this is the problem the Times Graphics Department had, and, um, and we built a tool for that. And the tool has been used for, I don't know how long, maybe five, six years. Um, might be wrong. And we actually open sourced this this year, like a couple of months ago, um, in February, I think. Um, it's called AI to HTML. It's not a not a really uh, um, surprising title, but it's, it it says what it does. Like you have an Illustrator fine, you can create HTML, and um, so the this changes this 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 project uh, this process from you make the chart, you you load it in Illustrator and you you find it, you add all this annotation that you want, and then you can just publish it to HTML. Um, yeah, and if you want, I can I can uh, try a live demo because it's really quick to use and. Um, <laughs> And it's kind of I, I, I saw I, I've I experienced that it's easier for people to um, to to understand it when once you've seen it. So you, you want to see it or yes. okay, <laughs> that's good. Uh, so let's, let's say we want to do the same uh, the same chart that I just had of the average temperature in Rome, and then we want to add this kind of background. 
So you can use the, any charting tool you want to create this chart. You, you, you will figure out how to use it if you don't know it already, so I want to skip this part. Uh, Data Wrapper has this print to as PDF, which is essentially just using the print function of the browser. Um, it just helps you with the iframe. So you just run it in Firefox and you say print and save as PDF and then you just save this in, uh, in, your, in, your, in your project folder. Um, I already have it here so I don't need to save it again. Um, this only has the, the average temperature because this is like daily data and in, in, in DataWeber there's no way to mix daily data and weekly data. Um, so I created another chart that has the weekly min and max and there's like a step feature, uh, uh, like a step line feature in DataWeb, so I used that. So I have these lines, and I export it as PDF as well, so now I have kind of the raw material that I need to make this chart in Illustrator. And right, let me do a new one, otherwise you won't believe me. <coughs> so I simply go in here, and I open, um, I open the chart here, um, Illustrator is a vector graphic program, so it can read um, PDFs and any kinds of graphics. Here I have the, have the chart, it's, it's nice. It's usually this PDF export comes with a lot of crap that you can just remove using a, uh, I wrote a little, there's a little clean script that I, that I, will, I will post a link to it, so you can just um, use this to, to clean this. It will just remove some clipping mass and make it all like a nice editable, uh, editable chart. Um, so here we get here we get this chart. Let me open the other one too. Yes. So I run the script again. Clean the PDF. So and now I can just take remove, remove this. So this is the dangerous part where I do life stuff. Um, Yeah, it's, as I said, there's like a lot of crap that, come, that comes with the chart. So here I get this line, I get this line. I will copy some of the, um, of the grid lines as well, so, so I am able to place it at exactly the same position that I, that I want it to be. So now I go to this other chart, and I just place it in here. Need to make sure that I have, um, oh sorry, place it in. Okay, so I should, I should lock this for a minute. So I group it and lock it. So, so I, now I add this in here. Um, and I will I try to make sure that this is exactly, exactly the same position. Um, so you see the, this has been resized a little. So there's always, when, when, you, when you work with, the, with those charts in Illustrator, there's some kind of, uh, uh, you have to be careful not to, um, not to mess up with the, with the axis. So, but, I'm used, but that's why I copied the grid so I have it. Um, I, can, I can use this mode to make sure that it's perfectly aligned. So now it's, for this demo, it's perfectly aligned. Um, so now I get those two data sets on top of each other. I can get rid of those grid lines that I have. Yeah, I have them twice in the document. So now I have my lines together. I can uh, just use Illustrator to, to make these two lines into a, turn these into a shape. It's just a very quick, I just select the points and then tell them to, to, con to convert it to one shape. I have the shape. Um, just give it, make it a little transparent. Um, like this maybe, so I can get rid of all the stuff that I that I don't need. Unlock this and ungroup this, and I just remove some crap that I don't need, um, and just like just like do it for for now. So now I I'm, have my chart. Um, I will reduce the size to get just what I just the size that I want. Um, Remove this, I don't need this. So how can I get from here to, to the web? Um, the, the tool is called AI2HML. This is the website where you can download it. And all it really is, it is a JavaScript file that you put in this folder for your, in your Illustrator folder. It works on Windows and on Mac. 
that you just download the file, put it in the script folder, and um, then you restart Illustrator, and then you have it in, uh, in this like, script folder. You have the script menu, and, and there I have AI to HTML. And I can just, um, no, I need to save this as a new file. So this is my chart. Make it an Illustrator file. And save. And now I run the AI to HTML. And it says, nice work. So what it, what it did is created this folder, AI to HTML output. And, what it, and it, all it does is create this image without the text and then some HTML that has the text on top of it. So I can just open this in the browser. And there you, you see the chart. The chart is pretty small here, so it's probably because my, <coughs> my document is not, uh, is, I should make sure that the, that the artboard is in the, in the size that I want. So this says 200 pixels, we probably want to go like 600. Um, oh no, here, 600. So, and say 350. So this is the size that I want. Now I just resize the chart. Because it's all vector, I can I can do it. Um, run run it again. So now I can I can do even more. I can I can go in here and um, and do the the annotation and say this is the five day moving average. Add some line to this line so we know what 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 this is this is about. Make this line black. Um, can also say like this is um, hottest day. Um, put this in here. Move this a little over. So this is the kind of stuff that that is really fun if you're doing graphics because you can spend you can spend five minutes and do it quick uh, if you're on net, on deadline. But you can also try to uh, uh, be creative and. And do nice, uh, nice work, and add like the, the exactly the right arrow that you want. Um, just rotate it a little bit so you see it. So now I have it here. Put it in there. Look at it here. Looks nice. Just, just run the script again, and I have the, uh, the chart. Um, with the, I was talking about the responsiveness. So the way it, this works in AI to HTML is you just take this artboard and you just create a new version of it. Um, let's say this is the, the white version and then I create a version that is, um, that is not so white. I say this is, this is 300 pixel um, and then I just, just, I just do the editing in the chart and make it, make it smaller, fit it, in, fit it in here, res, res, rescale the text so that it's 100%, it's not so. And I can, I can fine tune it. Um, remove some of the years. I think I, let me just open one that I already made to, to save this a little bit. So here's one that I, uh, so here's one that I already made that has like the two versions um, of, of the chart. Um, And when I, when I, when I publish this, um, it will create two versions of the chart, and depending on, on the size of the, of the, of the container that the, that the graphic is in, it will switch to the corresponding version. So let me open this, um, and it will just change to whatever. So this is, this is how we do all most of our graphics, everything that's not uh, interactive, that we don't like code by hand, we just we just do an Illustrator. Um, if like if, if if there's like a plane crash and we need a quick map, it's just like we open a QGIS or some. We just create a basic map, get the get the some some like location on it, load it in Illustrator, do the fine tuning, and then run AI HTML, and have it have a graphic. And this, depending on on how how your your CMS works, you can probably iframe it, or you can, maybe you have an HTML embed object or something. You can, you can get the data, you can get this chart in your CMS, and um, yeah. So the tool is, um, 
It's free, it's, it's here, it's a big, it's a huge thing that, that, that this was being open sourced. Um, for a long time, this was be considered like the most valuable asset that uh, the graphics department has, like as an advantage for, uh, for other newsrooms. Um, but yeah, things, things have, have changed and now we, we are doing good stuff, sharing it with other newsrooms. Um, Here's, uh, again, the link. You, you will find a link to the slides. Here's this, just the script that I, that I made to, to clean the PDF. Um, yeah, and that's for the demo. Now, I don't know. How's the time? Oh, we still have good in time. Sure, sure. I wanted to say this. When you have questions, just ask right away, because 90 minutes is too long to remember then to the end. So I use Inkscape as a alternative to Illustrator. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm afraid we would have to make this because this is very much tied to Illustrator. It's using JavaScript, but the JavaScript is running inside Illustrator, so it's using um, the Illustrator API and and it's addressing all the stuff. I'm sure that, that, that Inkscape has a scripting thing too, but we haven't made a version for this. Um. So I don't know about you, but uh, when Gregor showed that to me, um, I was kind of relieved that you know you can see that they have to think about the charts and work on it to get the story out of it. So that's what we do together now in the next 15, 20 minutes in the first stage. Um, this is your task. Try to think of something, understand, try to understand the context, choose an appropriate visual display, which might be for our purposes, a simple chart, a line chart, a bar chart. Uh, identify and eliminate clutter, which we don't do, we, we just have an idea. Draw attention where you want your audience to focus. Tell a story. That is by Cole Nussbaum, it's a website we recommend. And there are three principles that you can apply to these ideas. The first one is, we already covered that, comparison. You need to have something like, this has moved, this has changed, and to show by what. The second thing that is a principle that's helping you is proximity. If there is a very severe accident, like a plane, and it's not close to us, we don't care. It's, it's very sad, but it's, it's like that. If there's an accident in India, and it's not affecting Europe or the Europeans, it might be very small news. If it's in Europe, it's big news in Europe. If it's the same in the US, so that's proximity. And it's, once we accept that humans are reacting stronger to stuff that is happening close to us, to our families, um, you can take that to your advantage. Uh, we recently had a discussion with uh, a publication from Pennsylvania. They did uh, simple charts on crime on campus, uh, on the problems of schools, like attacks on schools in Philadelphia, with simple charts. And it was the most clicked story for months because it had proximity. I, I want to know what kind of crimes can happen to my kids on the school nearby. And then the third level that you can work on is a surprise, that you find an outlier that is telling a story that is conver not converging with um, uh, the sentiment that what people thought of a situation, that it's much different. Uh, but that's the hardest to achieve. And it's only achievable if you really uh, are knee deep in the data. So this is why this method that we're going to introduce to you, the three by three, is very helpful. Um, you might know from development of websites that website developers do a lot of scribbling before they actually code. And it's very important because coding is expensive. If you, were, if you went down the wrong path for two weeks, something is coded, but it's not what everybody wants, it's expensive. So, the scribble thing that you do in advance can help you to look through all the iterations that might be there, and if you throw it away, you're throwing away five to 10 minutes of work, but not two weeks. And that's why a lot of the preparation stuff is done on paper. So 
Um, this is from an article in Medium where they describe how they develop apps using the 3x3 method. And now, uh, this is the task. Uh, pull out a piece of paper, maybe work with the person uh, side by side with you, and try to come up with an initial idea of a data-driven story. Um, we will give you 10 minutes, then ask like three or four of the teams to present the idea briefly in like a minute, and what you should be able to answer is what? What is the topic of your story? Like unemployment, like crime, whatever. Yeah, your idea. Then why do you want to report about it? Why do you think it's important? What would be the key point to find out? Because if you don't ask this question, you will end up with just publishing the statistics from the statistical office. And that's not a story. So, and then finally, think of... Um, uh, dear data, make something like a scribble. It's, it's enough when you say, I will have three line charts, or one bar chart, and one bar chart, and another bar chart, and try to show it by that. And that gets you going. And then you iterate in real projects, like doing it, and after time you might not do the scribbling anymore. But it's extremely helpful to get you going. So, ready to start, everyone? Like 10 minutes, is that okay? Okay. You're forming teams. If I can assist with ideas, if anybody has questions, I walk around. Um, usually I'm good with uh, talking people in or out an idea um, on these purposes. Okay.